of you who want to follow from your tablets or your hymnal is number 14 in the church, church hymnal only. One four in the church hymnal only. and loves his image there. 
Welcome to everyone as we continue in our messages. Welcome to all who are following on the internet as well. Today we're looking at the palmer worm, Joel's description of the most popular spiritual malady that affects human beings, the palmer worm. We are going to turn to our scripture reading, and then we are going to pray and go into our message. Our scripture reading is going to be bisected. We are going to read from 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, from verse 6 to 11. 1 Peter chapter 5, from verse 6 to 11. But when we reach verse 8, after reading verse 8, we are going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. You see how we are bisecting it? 1 Peter chapter 5, 6 to 8. Then, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, and then we'll continue from 9. 1 Peter chapter 5, from verse 6 to 8. Then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, and then continue in 1 Peter 5 to verse 11. 1 Peter 5, 2 Corinthians 2, 11. 2 Corinthians 2, 11 will be coming after verse 8 in 1 Peter 5. Simple enough? Okay. There's a reason for joining it that way as our message unfolds. Let us therefore stand as we read together. 1 Peter chapter 5, starting from verse 6 and reading to verse 7 and verse 8, and then going back to 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. So let's begin. Uh, 1 Peter 5 from verse 6. 1, 2, 3. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 2 Corinthians 2.11 Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Are we not ignorant of his devices? Continuing now from verse 9. Whom... Resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, steadfast, to him be glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Let us humbly seek the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather together in your name and and we come in the name of Jesus to you through the eternal spirit. We thank you that we have access to the most important office in the entire universe the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, where your throne of glory, and at the same time your throne of mercy, are. And where Jesus Christ, our substitute and surety, our Savior and Lord, our High Priest, intercedes for us and is accomplishing three important tasks. Interceding for the entire world, that is what keeps the world going as he pleads his blood, doing the work of investigative judgment 
and a special work of intercession and preparing of his final remnant. May we understand these tasks and cooperate with you. Bless us today in our study. We need your Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our understanding and we claim that promise in Jesus' name. Amen. God's thoughts and God's ways are higher than our thoughts and our ways. But we don't feel so. We feel that we are bright and we can bring down anything God says to our level. And if it isn't at that level, we throw it off. We are living under physical probation. And there is an investigative judgment which will declare whether we end up being condemned or saved. But right now, we are on probation. And no man is going to be judged until his probation is closed and his mind is fixed. When a man is on probation, he's given a chance to make up his mind. Once his mind is made up, then there is judgment, and the judgment declares his destiny. People don't understand that, so they ask a question like this. How come we are in all of this mess, and we are not under the Adamic condemnation? A question that shows that we need to understand God's ways and God's thoughts. So I'm going to ask you a question. Look at the mess the world is in. And Satan is causing all this mess to, uh, and all human choices and so on. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. Is Satan a defeated foe? Let me ask it again. Is Satan a defeated foe? The answer is resoundingly yes. Now, in our thinking, if we go to war and a foe is defeated, he can't be doing anything. You see our way? God says Satan is a defeated foe. And look at the trouble Satan is still causing in the world right now and ever since he was defeated. You see why we have to understand the word and the deep things of God. Quotation I quoted last week. We need to understand the deep things of God. But can you prove that Satan is a defeated foe from the Bible? One famous text, Colossians 2.15. Colossians 2.15. Open your Bibles. This is just a preface to our subject because it is important to understand something here as we, before we get going. Colossians 2.15. Uh, somebody can read it for me from the King James Version. Loudly. Yes. Having spoiled principalities and powers. What's the Bajan word for spoil? Having mashed up principalities and powers. Mashed them up. Okay. Listen to, listen to, these are of ages. This is the preamble. Listen to these are of ages, chapter 79. It is finished, page 758. Christ did not yield up his life that he had accomplished the work which he came to do. And with his parting breath, he exclaimed, it is finished. John 19.30. The battle had been won. His right hand and his holy arm had gotten him the victory. As a conqueror, he planted his banner on the eternal heights. Was there not joy among the angels? All heaven triumphed 
in the Savior's victory, Satan was defeated and knew that his kingdom was lost. Woo! Amen? A defeated foe. But listen now, we are also told that for the sake of man, his existence was prolonged. We are hard to understand things, so let me give you a story. I like the stories. Don't get fast with this story. Two old men were playing a game of checkers, and a young boy was watching. And a quarter through the game, a call came for the first old man. And the old man turned to the young boy and said, continue this game until I come back. And listen to me carefully. The game is already won. Don't let him frighten you. Just play till the end. He cannot win this game. How would the old man tell the boy? The game at this point it's already won. The young boy sat down and hit the other fella. You might he might have let this stiffen out of you. You may as well get up. And he nearly got up. If you get up, you lose. And he played and he played and he played to the end. And the fella was defeated. What did we just read in our scripture reading? We are ignorant of Satan's devices. And Satan's biggest device is for us not to believe that he's defeated and to frighten us into disbelieving the promises of God and we are cat sparkled by a foe that is already beaten. Ignorant of his devices? Jesus says, I send you forth. Let me read this piece from uh, uh, 490 Desire Virgins. We can start it, you know, this is a preamble because it's going to be important. We can see something. 490, these are ages. Page 490, these are ages. This is Jesus. This is the famous chapter, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. The scenes of the past and the future were presented to the mind of Jesus. He beheld Lucifer as he was first cast out from the heavenly places. He looked forward to the scenes of his own agony when before all the worlds the character of the deceiver should be unveiled. He heard the cry, it is finished. This is Jesus looking forward to Calvary. These are Vigils 490, starting at paragraph 3, and talking about it. He heard the cry, it is finished, which cry he was to make. John 1930, announcing that the redemption of the lost race was forever made certain, that heaven was made eternally secure against the accusations, the deceptions, the pretensions that Satan should instigate. So at the cross, heaven was made eternally secure at the cross. A man's redemption was made certain, and Satan was defeated. You heard all that? As we shall see today, our biggest problem is disbelief. Beyond the cross of Calvary with its agony and shame, Jesus looked forward to the great final day when the prince of the power of the earth will meet his destruction on the earth so long marred by his rebellion. So notice, he's already a conquered foe, though he's still to be burnt up at the end of the millennium. See how God, see how God talks? We can't reason so. We can't defeat a foe and still a Thousands of years ahead, he can be destroyed. We can't handle it that way. We don't know anything about that. See how God is talking? We don't go deep enough and we don't believe the word of the Lord. Okay. Listen to the next paragraph. Henceforth, Christ's followers were to look upon Satan as a conquered foe. So if we are not looking upon Satan as a conquered foe, we don't believe the word of the Lord. And before the game is done, we get up and lose. When if we play to the end, Lord, I'm with you all the way, even to the end of the world. If we play to the end, victory is assured because he's defeated. But we don't believe that. Don't believe it. And we let a defeated foe cat us 
And Jesus says, I told you henceforth. The old, what do you want to tell the young boy? This game is already won. Don't mind all the thought he will put down. Play it to the end. And the other fellow tried to frighten the young boy. He's talking foolishness. Get up and go along home, you're lost. That's what Satan tells us. And you know what's wrong with us? We are, we are ignorant of his devices. We are ignorant of his devices. Okay. The palmer worm. I can tell you something about the palmer worm as we get going. The Hebrew word is to gnaw away, G N A W, gnaw away. Eat away like a cancer. When you catch it, if you don't intervene early enough, it runs its course. The palm of worm. Notice in Joel 1 4, compared to Joel 2 25, Satan starts his destruction with the palm of worm. And when we come to the restoration, getting the palm of worm cured is the last thing God can do. Not because God can't do it, but because of the unbelief of his people. So Satan starts destruction with the palm of worm. And God doesn't get the palm of worm cured until the last, Joel 2.25, because of the unbelief of his people. Hope you're following me. Satan is a conquered foe. So when somebody said that can't be true because look at the trouble Satan is causing, you know how to reason with them. They're reasoning according to man's reckoning. That is what we do all the time. Okay. So Jeremiah 13, 23 asks this question. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or the leopard his spots? Then may he also do good that are accustomed to do evil. That's a question. Answer that question in your heart. Answer that question in, the, in your heart. Okay. I wonder what answer you're saying. Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may he also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Jeremiah 13, 23. Listen to this statement from Desire of Ages 1, 7, 2. Listen carefully. No human invention can find a remedy for the sinning soul. What was that? No human invention can find a remedy for the sinning soul. Listen now. No human religious invention. No human educational invention. No human sociological invention. No human psychological invention. No human medical invention. No human scientific invention. No human economic invention. No human political invention can find a remedy for the sin and soul. All those things, listen to me carefully, all those things can produce an outward correctness of behavior that may make you a decent, law-abiding citizen, but none of them can remedy sin. Are you with me? No human invention can find a remedy for the sinning soul. Now, the principle by which God lives is the principle of self-sacrificing love. The principle that is in rebellion against that is the principle of self. Self-exaltation, selfishness, self-seeking, self-centeredness, self-wanting its own way, retaliation. And this self causes problems in church, causes problems in marriage, causes problems in the workplace, causes problems in the world, that self can mash up anything, palm a worm right through, lick it up, self. And God by nature is governed by the principle, 
of absolutely unselfish, self-sacrificing, agape love. God. Now Satan, knowing that he's defeated, has become the greatest corn man, corn individual, corn angels of all time. And he has invented and engineered a device and he brings out new models. And I want you to follow me carefully. That was the Zara Vegas 172. No human invention can find a remedy for the sin and soul. Listen to Desire Visions 35. I'm moving slowly. I want you to get in so that when we accelerate, you will understand where we're going. Desire Visions 35. Listen now to this. The principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. Now, when Satan comes to religious people, he can't come and tell them outright, I want all y'all to be selfish. They will throw him out. He doesn't come that way. You think he's a fool? He comes now in a religious guise and hides selfishness under a religious cloak. And he tells them, you have to work very hard and do what is right to save yourself. And let me tell you something. That principle has cat spraggled more systems and churches and individuals than any other. And Satan modifies it. To use the new word, now I hear people using, tweaks it. I don't know about the word. Tweaks it. I know the old time word, spins it. Let me read it again. The principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. Listen to the shocking statement. In the days of Christ, it had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Well, well, well. In the days of Christ, Satan had gotten, well before that too, that same principle to be now the basis of the Jewish religion, the chosen people at that time. And now comes the shocking statement. The two shocking statements. Satan had implanted this principle. Listen now. Wherever it is held, men have no barrier against sin. Shh. Wherever the principle is held, that you can work hard and obey your own strength to get right with God, you have no barrier against sin. That seems so paradoxical. You see God's ways and understanding totally different to ours. If a man is working very hard to obey, is that that in his own strength? Is that that a barrier against sin? You saw me reason? Let me read the statement again. This is Avengers 35. The principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. It had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Satan had implanted this principle. Wherever it is held, men have no barrier against sin. Whoa. And so Satan has engineered this device. You know, technology now, new devices come out all the time. Satan has engineered, engineered this device. It is a very clever counterfeit. And Satan has produced and continues to produce new models all the time. What is this religious invention? We just read it. It is the principle that man can save himself by his own works. That man can work out God's promises by his own works. That man can do anything by his own works. And that he doesn't therefore need the promise of God or God. And of course, the person who's doing it doesn't realize that they're sin. They don't need God. It's very subtle, very insidious. Now, this principle goes by different names. Listen to some names. A.T. Jones says one of the best names for it is ceremonialism. 
Hear that word? Ceremonialism. Another term is salvation by works. Another term is the old covenant. Another term is lukewarmness. Joel calls it the palmer worm. And in case you don't know, Satan has a model of this device to sue every taste. There are some people like this kind of phone and next kind of phone. Satan has a model of this device to sue every taste. Listen to these models now. And let's prove it before we continue. For the person who is not born again, he has a model of that principle for that person. You hear what I just said? For the person who is born again, he has another model. For the person seeking perfection to pass the judgment, Satan has another model. And for a world riddled with problems and can't find any way out, Satan has the ultimate model. You think Satan easy? I mean, the Apostle Paul had taught and preached to the Galatians. As I said a couple of weeks ago, there's only one teacher above the Apostle Paul in teaching in the Bible, that's Jesus Christ. And Paul taught the Galatians. They said, Amen. Preach it, Paul. And Paul gone on a missionary trip and got news that a few Judaizers came down and cat spaggled the Galatian church from the gospel in which the Apostle Paul preached that gospel so sweetly, so convictingly, that they actually saw Jesus Christ on the cross. And in two twos after that, the Galatians gone. And Paul had to write back, oh, foolish Galatians, to use the good old Bajan Caribbean term, who hath bewitched you? No one woman, old woman tell you, bewitch? Who hath bewitched you? Woo! Satan is the counterfeiting genius. Okay. What I'm going to do now, I am going to uh, read some of these uh, tricks for you. And then we're going to come and zero home on the Palmer Worm and Adventist history. Now, this is important because uh, four generations of the third angel's message have gone since 1844. Four generations. Palmer worm. Let's hear the Joel 1 4 sequence. Palmer worm, locust, canker worm, caterpillar. God promises restoration in Joel 2 25. And in the restoration, where must he start? Locust, then canker worm, then caterpillar, and last, palm worm. So God cures last with what Satan started the destruction with. Not because God is not able, we shall see why. So let's, let's uh, confirm a few things. These are ages 98. These are ages, page 98. Listen carefully. The birth of a son to Zacharias, like the birth of the child of Abraham and that of Mary, was to teach a great spiritual truth. Was it a what? Was it a what? Was to teach a great spiritual truth. A truth that we are slow to learn and ready to forget. A truth what? That we are slow to learn. That's why it takes God to the end to get the palm worm out. Because God's people are slow to learn and easy to forget. All of us. Not you and not me. That's, God, that's what God says about his people. We are slow to learn and ready to forget. Listen now. In ourselves, we are incapable of doing any good thing. But that which we cannot do will be wrought by the power of God in every submissive and believing soul. You believe that? 
It was through faith that the child of promise was given. It is through faith that spiritual life is begotten and we are enabled to do the works of righteousness. <clears throat> These are verses 98, paragraph 3. Remember that. That's serious business. All right, let's look at some uh, tricks of Satan. Look at the various models quickly, quickly, and then we move on. Listen to this one. This is Steps to Christ, page 44, paragraph 2. Chapter 5 of Steps to Christ. Listen carefully. There are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey him to form a right character. Sounds familiar? Well, what is one of Satan's biggest tricks? You profess to serve God, and you rely upon your own effort to obey his law and to form a right character and to secure salvation. Listen to the rest. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ, but they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. You heard, that? You heard, you heard all that? Let me go over it again. Steps to Christ, standard page 44, paragraph 2 in the chapter 5. There are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey his law, to form a right character, and secure heaven. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ, but they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. Hear that religion? That was the religion of the Jews in Christ's day. So they added more and more commandments to the ten till they had according to Jones 110. Don't give your cow a little water on the Sabbath if it's thirsty. If you're walking through a cornfield on the way to the synagogue, you come pluck a few pieces of wheat to eat. A million rules. Listen now to the next statement. Next thing but it's shocking. Such religion is worth nothing. You heard that? Such religion is worth nothing. But Satan has conned the people of God that such religion is worth everything. When Christ dwells in the heart, the soul will be so filled with his love, with the joy of communion with him, that it will cleave to him and in the contemplation of him, self will be forgotten. You see that self? However, Satan can get self to be winning, be it religious self. And that's the one that he is most skillful at being a con angel at. This religious self. Once Satan gets self winning, you're gone. You could be doing all the right things for the reason of self. Satan still has self winning. And you're tricked. Whoa. Studying this this week would make me shudder. Well, well, well. Let's go on. When Christ dwells in the heart, the soul will be so filled with his love, with the joy of communion with him, that it will cleave to him, and in the contemplation of him, self will be forgotten. Love to Christ will be the spring of action. Those who feel the constraining love of God do not ask how little may be given to meet the requirements of God. They do not ask for the lowest standard, but aim at perfect conformity to the will of their Redeemer. So if you, if you constantly have to be telling people about standard, 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 and they're not moving, they don't have the love of God in their hearts. But as the basic pathology. Okay. That's one. So where's the, where's the trick for this, this, set of, this group of people? These are people who profess to serve God. And where's Satan's trick? They rely upon their own works, their own efforts to obey his law, to form a right character. Notice this. They want to form a right character. But such religion is worthless. Listen to another trick now. 
Somebody is hearing the gospel. He takes it easy. He has a model of this car, of this device for everybody. Some seem to feel that they must be on probation and must prove to the Lord that they are reformed before they can claim his blessing. You hear that trick? Satan says you can't claim the Lord's blessing until you're reformed. But you can't reform without the blessing. So he got you. Well, but let's read it again. Some seem to feel that they must be on probation and must prove to the Lord that they are reformed before they can claim his blessing. But they may claim the blessing of God even now. They must have his grace, the spirit of Christ, to help their infirmities or they cannot resist evil. Jesus loves to have us come to him just as we are, sinful, helpless, dependent. We may come with all our weakness, our folly, our sinfulness, and fall at his feet in penitence. It is his glory to encircle us in the arms of his love and to bind up our wounds to cleanse us from all impurity. And because Satan knows that is the way to be pure, he gives us the trick. You can't go until you are reformed. And you never go and can never be reformed. And what you call reformation is a counterfeit. A different model. That is uh, Steps to Christ, page 52, paragraph 2. Some seem, uh, sorry, uh, yes, some seem to feel that they must be on probation and must prove to the Lord that they are reformed before they can claim his blessing. But they may claim his blessing even now. We are to come to the Lord as we are. But he never sends us away as we are. Praise the Lord. Next trick. Next trick. This is the Laodicean trick now. This is the Laodicean model. As we shall see, when we compare Laodicea with Abraham, we will learn a few things soon from now. Listen to this one. This is Steps to Christ. Page 69, paragraph 1, chapter 8. Steps to Christ. Page 69, paragraph 1. Many have an idea that they must do some part of the work alone. Ah. They have trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sin. So as it says, you can't forgive yourself, so trust him for the forgiveness of sin. But once you're forgiven, you can proceed on your own. Has a model of deception to suit every taste. Many have an idea that they must do some part of the work alone. They have trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sin, but now they seek by their own efforts to live aright. You heard that? That's, let, let me tell you something, because we don't know. I don't know, we don't know. This is classical Laodicean lukewarmness. And we don't know. Listen to what Jesus, what we are told. But every such effort must fail. Woo. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness, all depend upon our union with Christ. It is communion with him daily, hourly, by abiding in him that we are to grow in grace. He is not only the author, but the finisher of our faith. Satan says all you need Jesus to do is to start the engine. And once they, I think most of us here who drive cars would have had the experience of a battery gone. So you need uh, somebody's battery to fix you up. And then, you, then if you get your battery charged by somebody that says battery, and you don't get, go and get a new battery, what will happen tomorrow morning? But Satan tells you, once you get this battery cranked up, you don't need anything else. New tricks. And another one. These are uh, Steps to Christ. Page 71, paragraph 2. This one now. This is these the Christians now. Listen to this one. This gets so many people. I tell you, Satan has a model for every taste, and some people like two and three models. You hear what I said? Some people just don't satisfy with one model, like two and three models. Listen to this model. When the mind dwells upon self, dwells upon what? Oh. 
It is turned away from Christ, the source of strength and life. You hear that principle? Once the mind dwells upon Christ, it is turned away from once the mind dwells upon self, it is turned away from Christ, the source of strength and life. Hence, it is Satan's constant effort to keep the attention diverted from the Savior and thus prevent the union and communion of the soul with Christ. Whoa. To all, to any or all of these, he will seek to divert the mind. Listen to the list now. And before she gives the list, he says... Well, this is after the list. Let me read the list. The pleasures of the world. Life's cares and perplexities. That's a hard one, huh? That's a hard one. Life's cares and perplexities. The faults of others. Woo! That's a big one for religious people. We religious people are clean bowl by that one at early o'clock. The faults of others. Or your own faults, sir. If he, if he doesn't catch you with the faults of others, he catches you with what? Your own faults. You think it's easy? Your own faults and imperfections. To any or all of these, he will seek to divert the mind. Listen to that statement. Do not be misled by his devices. That is why we are told we are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. It goes on to say, many who are really conscientious. You heard that? Many who are really conscientious and who desire to live for the Lord, he too often leads to dwell upon their own faults and weaknesses, and thus by separating them from Christ, he hopes to gain the victory. We should not make self the center and indulge anxiety and fear as to whether we shall be saved. All this turns the soul away from the source of strength. Commit the keeping of your soul to God. Trust in him. Talk and think of Jesus. Let self be lost in him. Oh, praise the Lord. So even worrying about whether we are going to be saved or not is a satanic ploy. Surrender to Jesus. Be preoccupied with Jesus. Meditate on Jesus. That is when you are secure. Like one day we went down to the school bus in the early days. Remember the Austin pass and saw me at the school bus and said, look at that nerd. And I tried, I so anxious to catch the school bus to get to school early. Worry no about self because I want to get licks. That I didn't know when the school bus passed. Focus on the wrong thing, self. And that self, you see what self can do? If I was looking to see when school buses will pass, if you're looking to Jesus, self is taken care of in the right way. So these are Satan's devices. And these are a few, few main ones. Your own faults, the faults of others. You start the Christian race and you feel you can continue on your own. You don't come and surrender all because somebody fooled you that you got to reform before you come. When you can't reform without Christ. All these are his devices. Okay. Have one more statement to come back to. But it is time to make a comparison. Now, let's go to Abraham. In Abraham's family, there were both covenants. How do we know that? Paul says in Galatians that Sarah and Hagar were an allegory of the two covenants. So both covenants, new and old, were in Abraham's family. Did Abraham ever laugh at anything the Lord said? Or it was only Sarah? Both. Okay. You know, if you open your Bible to Genesis 12, you see that Abraham was called and he moved. Our faith has to grow. It is the faith of Jesus given to us and has to grow in us until it reaches the gold standard. 
Faith has to go. We have to go. When we, be, when we have just begun, we have not finished. You hear what I said? When we have just begun, we have not finished. So God called Abraham. Abraham had enough faith to move. Praise the Lord. And right away, as Abraham heard God's call and move in Genesis 12, God gave him another promise. Genesis 12, 2. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. I will make you a great nation. You heard that promise? Okay. So Abraham went, got his family, and moved. Where did Abraham leave? Babylon. He left Babylon. The third angel movement came out of Babylon and made a start. Comparison. Abraham and the third angel movement. Looking at this thing called the palm of worm. And if it isn't cured, what will happen? Okay. Abraham went into Egypt. You know the story there. He said that his wife was his sister, which was half the truth. And in fact, therefore, was a lie. All right. He was afraid. Okay. The, the Bible presents human beings. Okay. Well, Eventually, what happened? Had, had not God told Abraham he would make him a great nation? Later on, Abraham said, look, uh, if you want to see where that is, uh, look at chapter 15. Just a synopsis here, chapter 15. I'm reading from the NIV, and this, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I will be your shield, and your, I am your shield, and your exceeding great reward. Genesis 15. Verse 2 now. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord Jehovah, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my, my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my house will be my heir. What is happening here? The original promise that I'm going to make you a great nation, Abraham, a human being, is struggling with it. He hasn't gotten a child yet. And he begins to say, well, I may as well let this man, Eliezer, will have to be my heir. I go childless. Verse 4, then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And he took him outside and showed him the stars and so on. And when God made that promise, God entered into the custom of the day and pledged himself that that promise was sure. Are you with me? As A.T. Jones says, God confirmed that promise in Christ. Okay. What happened after that? Well, years passed now. Years passed. Years pass. So years passing all the time. How old was Abraham when he was called out of uh, Babylon? 75. Okay. Years passing now. For chapter 16. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, The Lord has kept me from having children. See that concept in that time? Does the Lord keep anybody from having children? Some people will say yes. Some Christians will say yes. I'm reading the NIV. The Lord has kept me from having children. Go and sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. I like this. I love to put it in up to date language because we hide behind our care English sometimes. Go and, go and have this young girl and get some children. I can have to build my family that way because the Lord didn't give me the children. All right, notice what's happening. These are human beings. They, are, they have not yet reached the level of faith to believe and claim that promise. Enough faith to leave Babylon, but not enough faith yet to claim the promise that they're going to get a child of their own genealogy, of their own DNA. So A.T. Jones says at this point, the old covenant 
now begins to unfold in Abraham's family. Abraham went into it. Now, this girl is a slave. It's an Egyptian slave girl. So when the mistress says, you are to be my husband's mistress, or whatever you call it, she obeyed. She was not rebellious. <laughs> the Bible says that Abraham commanded his whole household after him. And some people read a lot into that that they shouldn't read. As if he beat them into submission. Anyhow, let's continue. So the girl went. And the plan, as A.T. Jones says, the plan worked very well. She got pregnant. Young girl. And now she got pregnant. She pompousette, as we say in Barbadian terms, before her mistress. You can't get any children for the master. I have one. And A.T. Jones says, the plan that worked so well now disgusted the source of the plan. How does that parallel with the third angel movement? Promise, come out of Babylon. The light on the investigative judgment and the Sabbath was coming. They quickly understood that perfection of character was necessary to pass the judgment of the living and to be ready for the final events. That the promise then, God's promise was to make them ready for those events, to give them perfection of character. But as time passed and other thoughts came in their mind, they unconsciously devised a plan to perfect their character. They tried very hard now, now that law was coming into view. And remember what Paul says in Galatians 2.16, this is the principle. No man is justified by works of law, but by the faith of Jesus. You see, there are two, two methods dangling over us. One method, Satan's method, be justified by works of law. Can't work. Sounds good. God's method, you're justified by the faith of Jesus. So people shifted their confidence and their focus from Christ to let us get ourselves ready by obeying everything God says we must obey. And in doing that, they're doing it in their own strength and don't realize that they have shifted their dependence from God to self. You see the cancer? You see the palmer worm? So it eats away. It eats away gradually. So this thing develops insidiously, gradually. The people didn't realize what was happening. Abraham had enough faith to come out of Babylon. But this getting of a baby, you know, uh, later on when the Lord told him, reiterated again, look, I am going to give you your own son. The Bible says he laughed in his heart. I said, the Lord don't understand biology down here, old man like me. And what did Abraham tell God? Oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. The Lord said, not Ishmael. I'm going to give you a son. When did, uh, notice this now. When things reach this point, God has to visit. When things reach this point, God has to visit. Just as he visited the Adventists in 1888, when their faith was on self, we can work very hard and obey everything. They didn't even know that they were doing it in their own strength to get through. A lost focus of Christ. It is insidious. It is subtle. It is malignant. It is metastatic. It spreads. So God visited Abraham. Abraham saw these three strangers and he told his wife, prepare some food. Strangers are coming. Hospitable people, kind people. And he soon quickly realized that these are not men. These are heavenly beings. And one... He could rightly worship Jehovah, the second person of the eternal Godhead. And while they're talking about their mission, they again give the promise. This same time next year, so and so will happen. This time now, Sarah, inside the tent, cackle in her heart. <laughs> Old woman like me. Womb was always dried up, not dry up more. 
Listen now. And Jesus said, Sarah, wherefore did you laugh? I didn't laugh. You see, when you are trying to fulfill God's promises in your own strength, what we were told earlier on, there's no barrier against sin. No barrier. So she told a lie. God said, you did laugh. You did laugh. And at last, the faith of Abraham and Sarah were cured and developed by this visit of the Son of God and they were cured of the old covenant. Developed the faith. And Paul, in his description of it in Hebrews 11, he mentions Abraham coming out. Then he mentions that Sarah's faith reached the point. Then he comes back to Abraham. No, he does it in those two parts. So Jesus Christ visited the third angel movement in 1888. And he was laughed at too. Abraham and Sarah laughed again. The antitypical Abraham and Sarah laughed again. Because they were looking, right now the Jews still looking for a Messiah that has not been promised. And they were looking for a latter rain that was not promised. Their latter rain was a system of law and prophecies and do this and don't do that. They had it all worked out. So when John started preaching the latter rain, they went to Sister White and says, this could be the third angel's message. This could be the loud cry. And the white says, it is the third angel's message. In verity, this is the beginning of the loud cry and the latter rain. They couldn't believe it. So they rejected the visit of Jesus. And I tell you something, once you reject the cure for the palm of worm, from then on, it is downhill. Abraham did not reject the visit of Jesus. Look how, look how patient and sweet Jesus is huh? with us. He visited his friend. And, and you know, after that, God wasn't finished with Abraham. Abraham you know, he had to see him. Before the visit, he had received the circumcision, cut off the flesh, but still didn't fully understand it because he was still uh, he and Sarah were still laughing. But watch it now. After the son was born, so he developed the faith to have the son. Praise the Lord. But it wasn't the faith at the full corn in the air yet. It wasn't sealing time yet. So God told him, take the son, your only son, and take him up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. We know A.T. Jones goes to town on that. He now had to believe the word of God as against the word of God. And tell me how you're going to believe the word of God as against the word of God. He couldn't sleep. He tossed in night and day. He dare not tell Sarah. Dare not tell Sarah. This is nothing against women. Dare not tell Sarah. All due respects, ladies. Sarah was the one who devised the scheme. She developed enough faith to have the son, but to tell Sarah now, are you going to take the young boy up Mount Moriah and sacrifice him? Lord, have mercy on the situation. So Abraham struggled and struggled, and he said, you know something? The Lord will have to solve this problem. He had now come to the point Whatever the problem, I am going to trust God, surrender to God, and depend on God. I am not going to try to work out anything in my own scheme. God has to do it. He says sacrifice, I will sacrifice. He would have to raise him from the dead. And God said, hold it, Abraham. Now I know. And some people misinterpret that. that God, didn't know, but God doesn't know everything. But God speaks to us in our own human language. God is saying, I've tested you. And all heaven now sees that you've reached the level of faith that will never take my work into your own hands to try to work out my promises and my will your own way or even try to be right by obeying in your own strength. You are now totally dependent on me. Amen. Abraham was cured of the palm of worm early o'clock. But not so with the Adventist world. When Christ came in 1888, they made laugh and sport. Then came the canker worm degeneration. And the, then came the locust degeneration. Locust was a rejection. The canker worm and the caterpillar. Now I'm saying this now as I close. 
this is the generation of restoration because that cancer has run its course. But even, even there in, in Genesis, God, you see the generation concept, God told Abraham, the, the cup of the Amorites, the Amalekites, is not yet full. In the fourth generation, they're going to come back here. So four generations, the cup is full. Thereafter, a new start is made in terms of completing restoration. And God put in place the things to restore coming down the line, you know. Because in that very uh, third generation, after the second generation rejection, when we in a short came back, people then got hold of the 1888 message and started to look at it themselves. Now, I'm, if this is the generation of restoration, listen to me very carefully. And Satan sees that we are understanding certain things, the watches and the generations, and that we don't know the day or the hour, but we know special seasons when God visits his people, the hour of our visitation. Jesus said that the Jews, the Jerusalem, did not know the hour of their visitation. The Messiah was there. You know, I ask myself a few questions sometimes. If I were living in the days of Jesus, would I believe that he was the Messiah? Or would there be orthodoxy, the, the authorities and the church leaders say, if, if you're not doing what we say, if you're not in these walls, if you're not in the uh, ambit, the, the conference of the Sanhedrin, you have no salvation. And many people believed, but wouldn't believe because of that. Nicodemus came at midnight with a whole set of long talk. Would you believe that Jesus was the Messiah? That poor boy dressed in po poverty when the theology of the day said that the Messiah would be a pompous king coming to set the Jews free. The mystery of belief and unbelief. And now we've come to a generation of restoration. And we can lay hold of the promises of God. We have learned, I believe, I should have learned, I believe, from the lessons of past generations and the lessons of our own lives. We should now be understanding the devices of Satan. That to perfect Christian character and truly obey and truly keep the Sabbath has to do with being in Christ, surrendering all, having his righteousness. You see, Christ is the living law of God. The law of God is not something on stones that you look at and try to obey. Christ is the living law. He's the righteousness of God. When you have him, you have the law of love written in your heart. And as you submit, your obedience will not be your effort but Christ in you, the hope of glory. Satan understands where we are heading. He knows this is a special moment and he's going to come with all of his tricks refined and practiced over the generations. We must not be ignorant of his devices. None of those things we listed, the pleasures of the world, the faults of others, our own faults, none of those things should be occupying our minds now. Christ and Christ alone. Christ and him crucified. And as we get to know Jesus and trust him and surrender to him and cry out to him, later on in this series we'll be talking about wrestling with God. Wrestling with God, how few know what it is. Praying until every fiber on the soul is on stretch and darkness seems to be in Engulfing the soul, and we don't let go. Like Jacob, we say, unless you bless me. We have to be praying and studying, and even that cannot be a works program. As we look to Jesus, the Holy Spirit will inspire us to pray more, to study more, it will give us deeper understandings. This is the generation of restoration. This is watch number two. This is a special time of God's visitation of his people to prepare us for the final events. 
Let us learn from Abraham. Let us learn from the past. Let us claim these promises. And I, the last quote before we sing or close in him, which is uh, going to be on the screen, uh, 227 from the old, Behold the Savior at the door. Last quote. Listen carefully. Jesus continued, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit of spirit. By nature, the heart is evil. Who can bring a clean thing out of un an unclean, not one? No human invention can find a remedy for the sinning soul. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Romans 8, 7, and Matthew 15, 19. The fountain of the heart must be purified before the streams can become pure. Listen now. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. You heard that? He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. There is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion, a form of godliness. The Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There is death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be wrought, brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. And this change has to be ongoing. There's so much of self as we shall see. We must ultimately be emptied of all self. And when we are just born again, we are not emptied of all self yet. It has to be ongoing, ongoing. Until emptied of all self, we have the faith of Jesus reaching gold standard in our minds. This is the glorious work ahead of us. It is the work that God says he will do it. He will finish it. He will do it. He will finish it. He wants us to trust, believe, surrender, and never think we can do his work for him. Remember those two quotations we had in the last camp? If, if the eye is kept fixed on Jesus, the spirit ceases not his work of conforming us to his image. And Jesus ceases not to present us to his father, moment by moment, complete in himself. Jesus is everything. Jesus is our all. He is our righteousness. He is our law keeping. When we have him and submit to him, we will obey all that God wants us to obey properly, perfectly, and in the right way because it is the righteousness of Christ. Behold the Savior at the door. Brother Bruce, behold the Savior at the door. He gently knocks, has not before. Our religious duties... Everything else has kept him out, the religious self. But he wants to come in. Today, we should reconsecrate ourselves to this Savior and repudiate every human effort that puts itself in the place of God and let God in Christ prepare us and equip us. Behold the Savior at the door. For those who want to use your tablet or your hymnal, it's phone at number 
Our gracious Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus and our Savior who is interceding, we thank you for your patience. Your people have been all down through the ages unbelieving, and so have frustrated your work and your purpose but you've patiently waited and waited to bring them where they ought to be as they chose to trust, believe, and surrender. We are now in the final going down. We've gone through four generations, a complete cycle since 1844 to 2004. We are now in a new first generation. This is the second watch, the second decade. And all heaven is waiting to be gracious. Oh, deliver us from self in every dimension. Give us the faith of Jesus that Abraham had and allowed it to develop to the gold standard. Set us free from the bondage of our own works, the bondage of sin. Because if we are trying to obey in our own steam, we will have no barrier against sin. But when we receive the righteousness of Christ as a free gift imputed, as a free gift imparted by being in you, surrendered to you, trust in you, you will work both to, in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Oh, forgive us, convert us, transform us, perfect us. It is your work. Give us the faith to believe and submit. And as your spirit motivates us, may we pray more and wrestle with you and study and let your character within us by the Holy Spirit shine out as we trust, believe, and submit. Turn us around. Deliver us from the destructiveness of the locust species and set us free in Jesus Christ. In your name, dear Jesus, we pray to your Father in thanksgiving. Amen and amen. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. May God bless you real good as we keep our eyes on Jesus and abide in him and pray for each other. <laughs>